Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the day. Thank you again for the blessings you've given us. Thank you for your, your love and your watch care over us. Just pray you may be with the students as they continue in the fourth quarter. I just pray you be guided in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at your homework. Yeah, questions two, three, four, seven, and nine. Wait. Whoa. No, I'm uh, sorry. Looking in the wrong class. Three, five, and seven. Um, so, can you tell me what uh, what the chemical makeup of rubbing alcohol is? I'm told what the solvent is and what the solution is. I was in the book. No, it wasn't. Like that. Uh, she found it. So that means that it wasn't really obvious it was there. You really had to look for it. But I did. I did get. Um, which one was it? Egg whites. Egg whites no, or not? It was the first one. Oh, yeah. sterling yeah. silver. Yeah. It was a solution. The solvent is silver. And the solute is copper. We talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that in class actually. You told us to write it down. It's kind of like, thank you. So we're even now, Ms. McLaughlin. <laughs> All right, number three. How is dissociation and ionization different? This one makes no sense because isn't this disassociation happens with ionic compounds and ionization happens with covalent compounds? Correct. But that makes no sense. Do you think ionization would happen with ionic compounds? <laughs> Well, ion is, uh, dissociation occurs between ionic compounds because they're breaking apart the particles that are already ionized. Mm -hmm. But uh, ionization is a covalent compound that is broken apart into its separate ions. What's the, uh, so take for, instance, H, take for instance HCl, hydrochloric acid, mm -hmm. is, a ion, is a covalent compound. They are sharing electrons. Mm -hmm. But when, water, when it dissolved in water, uh, the... the water particles will actually separate the atoms into its separate ions to H plus and Cl negative. So that would be ionization uh, when it happens to a covalent. Because normally a covalent compound would not break apart into ions. Ionic compounds, yes, they would. Mm -hmm. So if you put an ionic, if you melt an ionic compound, then you have a separate ion uh, and as well as you put it in water. But when you have covalent compounds, a lot of covalent compounds do not dissolve, so they do not ionize. So when a covalent compound do, does ionize, uh, then they're breaking into their ion, uh, ionic form. Uh, so there's the difference. Uh, so it's a very slight difference, but one happens with ionic compounds, one happens with uh, covalent compounds. Uh, number five. Uh, describe how you would create a saturated sugar water solution for making candy. Can you just add sugar to the water and eat it? Not for a saturated. You just water, right? not, not for a saturated. You just pour in the sugar at the early in that early temperature. Okay. You can tell it's the water is saturated. saturated. So how do you know when it's saturated? Sugar. When the water can't dissolve the sugar anymore. Yeah. Alright, so when yeah, so a saturated solution would occur when you cannot you keep on putting sugar in and stirring. The sugar disappears, it's not saturated yet. Put some more sugar in, you stir it some more, and the sugar disappears. Alright, so it's not saturated yet. You put in some more, you stir it, you stir it up. Sugar can't dissolve. Correct. We already said that. Like, oh, yeah, sugar doesn't dissolve anymore. Then you have a saturated solution. So then, super saturated would be when you have more sugar than water. No, it, super, uh, super saturated is when you have more sugar dissolved than what possibly should dissolve. That's why you boil it. That's why you boil it. Oh, that's why I, I said you heat it. That's why. You, that's why you would heat it. Because if you heat it, we're gonna we're gonna learn when you heat it. It, the solubility is going to go up. Why? Because oh, of the action of the molecules. Is it more space in your pan? So Correct. Like It'll be like. Thing. So, yeah. 
What's so when you, when you heat it up, so you get that heated up substance to a saturated solution, then you cool it back down. Now, at that temperature, you would have a super saturated because now you have more sugar dissolved than what would normally uh, be able to dissolve at that temperature. So, so again, saturated, you pour in the sugar, keep pouring it in until no more would dissolve, you're saturated, pour in the sugar, until you no more would dissolve, heat it up where that sugar would dissolve, and then you cool it back down, and then you have a super saturated solution. All right, and then number seven, for each of the following substances, decide whether it's a solution or not. If it is, first list the solvent, and then the primary solute. Sterling silver, solution or not a solution? Solution. 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 Primary solvent? Solvent. All right, and the solute? Copper. Copper. Chocolate milk. Solution. Not a solution. No. Not, a, not a solution. It's, I told you. It's milk and syrup. It's, it's milk. milk and, it's milk and chocolate. Milk is a heterogeneous mixture. Milk itself is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, milk itself is a heterogeneous mixture. Uh, yeah, so I, so why do you think it's a heterogeneous mixture? I've never I understood. Why is it cubish? Connor, you just wanted to say that it wasn't a solution because you were too lazy to write out what the solution That is not true. Were. I did not say that. Yes. 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 All right, yeah. We talked about that when we talked about uh, matter and the different types of matter. Uh, we said that milk was heterogeneous because uh, if you look at it carefully, you can actually see where uh, the fat molecules are. If you let milk sit around for a while, it actually separates. In a solution, it will not separate no matter what. Uh, so milk is a heterogeneous mixture. So therefore, chocolate milk would have to be a heterogeneous mixture. So therefore, chocolate milk uh, would not be a solution. But root beer is a solution, right? Root beer is, it? is a solution. Is right. solvent carbonated water? In the solvent, solvent is not carbonated water. What's the solvent? The the solvent would be soda. The, soda. The, soda. The, soda. the water. Well, yeah, that, that's carbonated. But oh, the carbonation is the solute. But what about the syrup in it? All right, the syrup would be the solute. So there's multiple solutes. There's multiple solutes, yes. Letter D. Egg whites. No. Yes. Yes. Why are they? Egg, not, not eggs, but egg whites. Oh. The egg white. What about the egg white? Maybe the solution. There's like protein. What's the solvent? Yeah, but I can see the... Can solvent see the is water. How is there water in the egg white? There is. <laughs> How is there not water? All right. And the solute is proteins. The solute's what? Proteins. Basically, yes, you could. <laughs> All right, rubbing alcohol. It is a solution. It is a solution. Oh, it's water. The solvent is water. Not water. Alcohol. Alcohol. The solute is water. The solute is water. Oh, yes. Rubbing. Rubbing. <laughs> Divers air. So if you're a scuba diver, the it air is. that they use it is, is a solution. All right. Is the solvent oxygen and solution nitrogen or is it backwards? No, it's the other way. Solute. Other, other way around. Nitrogen. Solute is nitrogen. So, uh, the like solvent that. is nitrogen. The solute is oxygen. I don't like that. Just like our atmosphere, our atmosphere, the solvent is nitrogen and the solute would be oxygen. It's pure oxygen, but I'm like super close. So it's, it's the same as our. Is the atmosphere, right? Yeah, it's a different mix, but the same. It's the same. It's the same thing. It would be. So the solvent is nitrogen. Yes. Okay. You're just stupid. Okay. So very good. Go ahead and pass those four, please. Atmosphere in the bottle. Isn't the whole beauty of the solution not being able to see what's going on? What? So why do we have to pick it up? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, so we are talking about solutions. The solutions are named according to their the solvent, the solvent state. Whatever the state of the solvent is, that's the type of solution we have. So a solid solution, we would have a solid solvent. And the solutes that's possible for a solid solution would be solid liquid and gas. Solid liquid and gas. Exactly chaos in Well, here. I think it took you forever. Really, Gabby? Because you couldn't. Ah, it's not it. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, let's go quickly. <laughs> All right, gas solutions. All right, the solvent is gas. All right, gas. And what type of solute can we have? We don't know. We have water and liquid gas. I mean, liquid, liquid and gas. Gas solutes. Connor, be quiet. We talked about the fifth one. All right, gas solutes. Our gas gas solution is our atmosphere is the most common. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% of other trace gases uh, would be uh, our atmospheres. When you look at this, you know, you think 1% of other trace gases. Again, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide is what plants need. <coughs> and that's, that only makes up 1% of our other, other gases. So you can think of the amount of nitrogen and oxygen that's in our atmosphere uh, when we do that. Uh, but we, water or liquids and solids, gases will not uh, dissolve. If we have a water particle that is in air, what, what do we have? All right, remember, if we're talking about water vapor, water vapor is a gas. So that would still be a gas-gas solution if you're talking about human air. That's still a gas-gas. But if we have a liquid water particle in air, Rain. what do we have? Rain. A cloud. A cloud. Wet air. Or wet air would be considered mist. fog or mist. All right? So the, uh, a cloud in the air where the water particle is suspended is a uh, liquid gas mixture, but it's not a solution. If we have a solid, a solid in air, what do we have? Dust. What did you say? I said dust. Dust, yes. Dust. All right. Our atmosphere is not going to dissolve the solid particles there. Or even smoke. Smoke is a solid uh, gas mixture. Uh, and again, you can see the difference between the solid particles, the smoke, 
in the atmosphere, so it does not dissolve. So we cannot have a liquid gas or a solid gas solution. The only thing that we can have is a gas gas solution. All the other ones, a solid solution, we can have solid, liquid, or gases as solutes. And as a liquid solution, we can have solid, liquid, or gas solutions. Uh, so, uh, so a gas solution would only have a gas solute. All right, so there's two steps in the dissolving mechanism uh, when we dissolve substances. So we're, we're going to look at a, a solid-liquid mixture uh, when we're dealing with dissolving, the dissolving mechanism. Uh, there's two steps. We take, we take salt, NaCl, put it in water. Before it can dissolve, we notice that the salt just falls to the, ground, to the floor of the container. So the salt is still there, and unless we leave it sitting there, then the salt all of a sudden starts to disappear. Now we could speed that up a little bit by stirring or heating it up, but if we didn't want to speed it up, we just put the salt in. The salt would fall to the bottom of the container, and let it sit, and eventually the salt disappears. So what's going on? All right, the first step is dissociation. Basically what's happening is we're overcoming the attractive forces of the particle of the solute and solvent. And really it should be only the solute, not and solvent. All right, overcoming the attractive forces between the particles of the solute. Now again, we talked about water being the universal solvent because it is polar. So we put an ionic compound in the water. Water is polar, so it has opposite charged ends. Well, the positive part of the water is going to attract the negative part of the ionic compound. The negative part of the uh, water is going to attract the positive part of the compound you put in. And they're going to be so, the attractive forces between the water and the particle is going to be so strong that they're actually going to pull the compound apart. And that's what the first step is. The first step is we have to break it down. We have to break it down into its smaller pieces. Uh, we have to pull it apart, uh, sort of like the ants on a dead cockroach. The ants come in, they start pulling the dead cockroach apart. They take this piece and take this piece and take this piece, uh, and so on. Uh, so we're dissociating or disassembling the particle. So overcoming the attractive forces between the particles of the solute. All right, so take the solvent out of that. I don't know why that's there. All right. It's called a process of separation and it absorbs heat. It absorbs heat. It needs, it will, needs energy to be able to uh, pull these particles apart. That is why it dissolves much easier in warmer water than it does in cold water. Because it needs that energy uh, to be able to pull those particles apart. Uh, and again, when we heat up an ionic compound, what does that do to the particles? Further apart and it speeds them up. All right, so it helps the water actually pull these particles apart. So it absorbs heat. The second part is the solvation. The solute particles actually surround, I mean, the solvent particles actually surround the solute particles. The solvent particles actually surround the solute particles. So say for instance, it would, be, it would be something like this. If I had two teams, all right, I had a blue team, all in blue, I had a red team, all in red, all right? And the red team was much larger than the blue team. So the blue team is the solute, and the red team is the solvent. The blue teams all connected with their arms. They're all connected together. Uh, so we have a big chunk of blue team uh, that's thrown into the room with a bunch of red team. They're not hooked together, they're just, they're just all separate. So what's happening is, so when that blue team gets dropped into the room of the red, all right, now the red team are now going to start pulling apart the blue team. They pull this one person away, and then when they pull that one person away, uh, three or four of them come around and surround them. All right, that blue color kind of disappears with the red. 
All right? And as they keep pulling that blue team apart, eventually they pull all those particles apart one by one and surround them. So now all we see in that room is a sea of red because all that red has surrounded the blue and we don't see the blue anymore. And that's what's happening in the uh, salvation state. The salvation, we are surrounding the solute particles. So the opposite charge between the molecules helps surround the particles. Again, these positive attract the negative and the negative attract the positive. And again, this is why the solute is usually the lesser amount and the solvent is the greater amount uh, because we need that surrounding and we need more particles to surround. Uh, we can't surround one particle with one particle. We have to surround it with a bunch, uh, a number of other particles. All right. The solvation step is called hydration when it's water is the solvent. So again, water is not the only solvent we can have. There's many other different solvents that we could have, even though water is the more common. It's the universe, it's the one that is uh, used most often. So that solvation state is really called hydration. We're basically hydrating the compound. This releases heat. This releases heat. So you got one step absorbing heat, you got one step releasing heat. So if dissociation absorbs more heat than solvation releases, what would be the net result? If dissociation absorbs more heat than solvation releases, what is the net result? It, becomes, it is cold because more heat is absorbed. And again, we feel cold because whatever we're touching is stealing heat from our body. So that's why it feels cold. That's why it feels cold. We feel heat because whatever we're touching is <clears throat> giving us a ton of heat. A lot, uh, a lot of thermal energy through that. That's why we feel heat. So if dissociation absorbs more heat than solvation releases, then it feels cold. Hence, we have the cold pack. All right? Look, most, most of you play athletics here, so a lot of times you have needed a uh, cold pack somewhere along the way, I imagine. All right? In that cold pack, there is a chemical, uh, ammonium nitrate, I believe it what it is and you have a little pack of water that's in there, that the water is separated. Well, what do you have to do? You have to break that pack of water. So now that water is starting to dissolve the uh, ammonium nitrate. So the dissociation is absorbing more heat than the solvation is releasing. So that's where you get the coldness of that uh, cold pack. Now what happens to that cold pack? Eventually, it's not cold anymore. Right? So that the, so once all that all that that chemical gets dissolved, then the coolness now starts dissipating because of the the change in temperature from your your surroundings. Uh, but initially, that cold pack will last maybe ten to twenty minutes, maybe uh, being cold, and and it's really cold. A lot of times, it's really cold. Uh, but that's what's happening in that that cold pack. Uh, because we are absorbing more heat than we, than we are releasing. Most of our dissolving mechanisms are going to be exothermic. A lot more are exothermic than endothermic. This code pack, ammonium nitrate, is endothermic. So it will absorb heat uh, as a net result. Right? So we have an endothermic type reaction, even though it's not a chemical reaction, it's a physical reaction in the dissolving, not chemical, where the dissolving mechanism results in a decrease of energy, dissociation absorbs more heat than salvation releases. It's endothermic. 
and Rick Leonard. Exothermic arrangement when the dissolving mechanism results in an increase of energy, the dissociation absorbs less heat than the solvation releases, then we have a net energy gain, which would be exothermic. A lot of times when you mix, mix acids with water, all right, that is an exothermic. If you put, if we're making a solution of or a more dilute solution of acid, a lot of times they, they, want, they want us to put that in a ice water bath to do because it produces a lot of heat. That, that glass gets very, very warm uh, when, you, when you mix that acid. Uh, and again, we always put acid in water, never water in acid. All right, we always put acid in water, never water in acid. You put, try to put water in acid, you're going to have some spattering, and that a lot of times that could cause acid to be spattered onto you uh, because of that uh, reaction that you would have. Uh, so we always put acid in water, never water in acid. That was just free information for you. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Oops. Now going back to that last slide, we talked about Water being a solvent called hydration, we need to know that also dissociation uh, is called ionization when the compound is covalent. So under the under dissociation, I'm not sure why I don't have that there, but let me go back here for a second. Here, when we're talking about dissociation, we should be called we should have called ionization when Solute is covalent. Call dissociation when solute is ionic. Different difference in the terminology. Ionization is still dissociation. We're still breaking apart the particle. But it just has a different name to it. How far back? Two more. Two more. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. One more. Wait, no, go back. Right there. No. No. <laughs> what? I'm just kidding. Uh, then we'll Are we going to do labs with acid? We will do a couple of labs with acid, yeah. Are we going to burn through steel? Ooh. Are we going to burn through steel? Are we going to burn through steel? We're going to burn through steel, but. We're going to do labs with acid. We're going to burn through steel. <laughs> Hydrochloric acid is probably the strong, one of the strongest. This is my brother. Oh, oh, okay. What can it burn through? Do my neighbors uh, my neighbors at its full strength, it probably can burn through metal. quite a bit of metal. Do my neighbors own mailbox or ask? No. My neighbors own ask all the time. You should have better research for dang time. All right, we're good here? My dad was telling me, like, where are you living? Can you help me? Can you Light dissolves light. All right, so when we're talking about dissolving, there's a saying that says light dissolves light. What that means is polar would dissolve polar, nonpolar would dissolve nonpolar. We've already kind of alluded to the fact that uh, why water is the universal solvent because of its polarity, being able to pull apart the ions of an ionic compound. But if you take that ionic compound and put it in a nonpolar solvent, well, there's nothing to be able to pull apart the ionic compound because there's no charges on that solvent. So it will not dissolve a nonpolar substance. Even though with the nonpolar substance there is some dispersion forces that are involved, Remember, we talked about dispersion forces being our weakest forces. Uh, so it, does, it will not pull apart those ionic compounds. 
So polar with polar and non-polar with non-polar. So if I take a polar solute and try to mix it with a non-polar solvent, will it be miscible or immiscible? Immiscible. Immiscible. If I take a polar solute and mix it with a polar solvent, they will be miscible. All right? So when we're talking about polar and po polar with polar and nonpolar and nonpolar, we're typically talking about covalent compounds. Because we know ionic are always going to be polar. So we're usually talking about ionic compounds. So nonpolar with nonpolar are miscible. Polar with polar are miscible. But if they mix them, they are not. It's sort of it's sort of described it's sort of described when you talk about wetness, all right? Because a duck doesn't get wet. How do you think that a duck can swim in the middle of winter, dead of winter, in a pond whose water is probably pretty close to ice cold? Well, the male the on the feathers. They have oil in their feathers. Because the oil is nonpolar. The oil is nonpolar. Hence, where we get the saying is let the words that are told you be like water off a duck's back. Because water on a duck would just roll off, it won't absorb into the feathers because of the oil in the feathers. That's why when we have an oil spill, that birds have a problem if they ever get stuck in that oil spill. Because now they have oil in their feathers, and the oil in the oil spill is nonpolar. Nonpolar will dissolve nonpolar. So now they get way too much oil in their feathers, so they can't fly. And well, they just have to sit like sink. They don't sink, they, don't, they like get stuck in like mud. Almost like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like get stuck in mud? Right. It's like that. But it's still like that. So how how do they how do they clean a, a the oil off the duck so or her with Dawn the drop of Dawn and grease is gone. <laughs> there you go. All right. You want to you want to you want to have something that will di will dissolve that nonpolar. But when they do that, they have to be careful because they don't want to take all the oil out. Uh, so they have they have to do, there there is some mechanisms that they have to do to do that. Uh, but it, but again, you know. The saying is, be like the water off a duck's back because things don't bother, some things don't bother people. Uh, I, I've, I've learned in the years that I've been around, uh, used, used to be that words would bother me. But now, a lot of times, words don't bother me as much. Now uh, it's back that just bothers us. Yeah. <laughs> it's all the words you, 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 back. Usually my son's bothering me. Uh, but, <laughs> So what were uh, those words? Uh, Dad, I love you. That's those are the words that bother me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He doesn't want you to love him, Clark. He, wow. wants you, he, wants to be, he wants to be easy when you leave. <laughs> but, uh, so this is what I was talking about. Like dissolves like. Right? If, it, if it's the same type of compound, then they will be miscible with each other. Ionic compounds and covalent compounds with dipole moments are polar. Well, ionic are polar because of the ionic. Uh, so here we got water, acetic acid, ammonia, hydrogen chloride. These are all covalent compounds that would have dipole moments. All right. Any of these, water, acetic acid, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, uh, these uh, would all dissolve ionic compounds because they they are polar. Where these here carbon tetrachloride, pentane, petroleum, gasoline, right, these are all nonpolar. So all these would dissolve each other, but none of these would dissolve water. If I have carbon tetrachloride, a jar of carbon tetrachloride, and I try to pour water in it. They would be separated. One would be water would be in one place, either on the top or the bottom, 
and carbon tetrachloride would be uh, most most likely we're going to top is probably more dense than water. Wait, what is carbon tetrachloride contained in petroleum? These are our these are our nonpolar comp compounds. These are our polar compound. So these two would not be miscable. These two could be miscable. These two could be miscable uh, because they're polar and nonpolar. I think I have. I had those in the wrong order. So these are these below here are covalent compounds without dipole moments. These are covalent compounds with dipole moments. It says ionic compounds and covalent co molecules with dipole moments are polar. All the examples I gave you were co covalent molecules. Uh, 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 All right, so we're going to stop there.